Apache Spark is a system for processing large data sets in parallel. The core abstraction of Spark is the RDD, the Resilient Distributed Data Set, which is a working set of data that sits in memory for fast, iterative processing. Matei Zaharia created Spark with two goals, to provide a composable, high-level set of APIs for performing distributed processing, and to provide a unified engine for running complete apps. High-level APIs like Spark SQL and MLlib enable developers to build ambitious applications quickly. A developer using Spark SQL can work interactively with a huge dataset, which is a significant improvement on batch hive jobs running on Hadoop. A developer training a machine learning model can put the model through multiple steps in the training process without checkpointing the data to disk. The second goal of Spark a unified engine for running complete apps, was the focus of my conversation with today's guest, Matei Zaharia. Matei is the CTO of Databricks, a company that was started to implement his vision for Spark and to build highly usable products on top of the Spark technology. Databricks Delta is a project that combines a data warehouse, data lake, and streaming system, all sitting on top of Amazon S3 and using Spark for processing. In our recent episodes about streaming, we explored some common streaming architectures. A large volume of data comes into the system and is stored in something like Apache Kafka. Backend microservices and distributed streaming frameworks read that data and store it in databases and data lakes. A data warehouse allows for fast access to the large volumes of data so that machine learning systems and business analysts can work with those data sets interactively. The goal of Databricks Delta is to condense the streaming system, the data lake, and the data warehouse into a single system that is easy to use. If you listen to the previous episodes, you will have an idea for the level of complexity that's involved in managing these as different systems. For some companies, it does make complete sense to manage your Kafka cluster, your Spark cluster, a set of S3 buckets, a data warehouse like Amazon Redshift... But we probably don't want all of that management to be the lowest barrier of entry. Databricks Delta will hopefully reduce that barrier of entry and make it easier for enterprises to set up large systems for processing their data. A few quick notes before we get started. We just launched the Software Daily job board. To check it out, go to softwaredaily.com slash jobs, where you can post jobs, you can apply to jobs. It's all free. And if you're looking to hire, or if you're looking for a job yourself, I recommend checking it out. If you're looking for an internship, you can certainly use the job board to apply for an internship at Software Engineering Daily. Also, meetups for Software Engineering Daily are being planned. Go to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash meetup if you want to register for an upcoming meetup. In March, I'll be visiting Datadog in New York and HubSpot in Boston. And in April, I'll be at Telesign in LA. I look forward to seeing you there. And I hope you like this episode with Matei Zaharia. Apps today are built on a wide range of backends, from traditional databases like Postgres to MongoDB and Elasticsearch to file systems like S3. When it comes to analytics, the diversity and scale of these formats makes delivering data science and BI workloads very challenging. Building data pipelines seems like a never-ending job, as each new analytical tool requires designing from scratch. There's a new open-source project called Dremio that is designed to simplify analytics on all these sources. It's also designed to handle some of the hard work, like scaling performance of analytical jobs. Dremio is the team behind Apache Arrow, a new standard for end-memory columnar data analytics. Arrow has been adopted across dozens of projects, like Pandas, to improve the performance of analytical workloads on CPUs and GPUs. It's free and open source. It's designed for everyone from your laptop to clusters of over 1,000 nodes. Check out Dremio today at dremio.com slash sedaily. Dremio solved hard engineering problems to build their platform, and you can hear about how it works under the hood by checking out our interviews with Dremio CTO Jacques Nadeau, as well as the CEO Tomer Chiran. 
And at dremio.com slash se daily, you can find all the necessary resources to get started with Dremio for free. I'm really excited about Dremio. The shows we did about it were really technical and really interesting. If you like those episodes or you like Dremio itself, be sure to tweet at Dremio HQ and let them know you heard about it from Software Engineering Daily. Thanks again to Dremio and check it out at dremio.com slash se daily to learn more. Matej Zaharia, you're the CTO at Databricks and the creator of Apache Spark. Thanks for making the time to come on Software Engineering Daily. Yeah, thanks for having me. So we're talking about Spark and some of the new developments in the Spark ecosystem today, but I want to start by just giving people a quick overview of what Spark is if they're not familiar with it or if they use it, but they're not really sure how it works under the hood. There's a variety of systems that we've seen for processing large data sets. And what set Spark apart was the idea of the in-memory working set. Explain why the abstraction of the working set, the RDD, was important. Uh, yeah, for sure. So basically, when we started the Spark project, we were seeing many different distributed programming models for clusters, including MapReduce, different programming models for graphs, such as Apache Giraffe, different programming models for streaming, and so on. And we realized that inside a, a large application, people will want to basically combine different computations and to do so efficiently. And with these different systems, there wasn't the concept of uh, storing data in an efficient way to feed it into the next computation. You could run, for example, a MapReduce job, but then the output of that would always go to a distributed file system. And then maybe you would run another MapReduce job on the result, or maybe you would run, you know, maybe you would run something like Giraffe for graph computation or something like that. So we figured basically data sharing is essential if you want to compose software and every developer you know becomes productive by being able to compose lots of little pieces of software so we wanted to make that efficient so in spark we added built-in concept of keeping data sets in memory in a fault tolerant fashion and sharing them efficiently across computations and we were able to you know to support these end-to-end -end workflows you also had a novel approach to resilience of these distributed data sets the the idea that instead of backing up a data set by checkpointing to disk, your back backup was more uh, implicit because you knew that you could always recreate an intermediate data set in the event of a failure by rerunning some previous operations. Why was this a novel recovery mode? Yeah, so so compared to what people were doing in these other systems, it's it's basically just a more efficient way to do fault recovery. It only works when you have deterministic computations that you can rerun. But in these programming models, you were asking people to have deterministic computations uh, anyway in order to do fault recovery. You know, even within a single job. So so basically instead of using something like a distributed file system where it doesn't know anything about how the data was computed and it just has to replicate it and save it to disk in order to make it reliable, in Spark, we actually track the computation that went into each piece of data. And if we lose that, we were able to redo the computation just on that part of the input. And then the other aspect that's, that's pretty cool is because it's a parallel computation. If a node fails, we can have, we can split up the work of recovering it across 100 nodes and basically recover 100 times faster than it would have taken that one, you know, it would have taken to bring up one new node. So so basically, you can recover quite quickly if even if, if a small fraction of your nodes fail, and you don't pay that extra cost of replicating data and storing it to disk. And this core idea of the RDD that provided this working set as well as this new durability model this has led to an ecosystem around Spark. So the last time that you and I spoke was two and a half years ago. How has the ecosystem evolved in that time? 
Yeah, quite a bit has happened since then. It's still a very active open source community. Uh, lots of different uh, individuals are contributing to it. So probably some of the biggest changes are in some of the libraries on top of Spark. And uh, Some of these are included in Apache Spark as built-in libraries, but there are also many third-party external packages that, that work with it. So I think Spark SQL, the sort of structured data library, was just starting out back then. And same with the data frame API on top of that, which is very popular now. It's a it's a programmatic way to you know to, to, to work with uh, structured data. It's basically similar to building up SQL queries, but it's much easier to organize into large programs, and it enables the engine to do a lot of optimization underneath. So that's one of the major things that's come out. Now I basically a majority of users are using that API in some form. The other big thing that started a little over a year ago is structured streaming, which is high higher level streaming API based again on structured data where we can understand and the data types and do optimization similar to what a database would do. That's now reached uh, sort of general availability and it's a much easier way to write streaming computations. Basically, you don't need to think about streaming operators. You just write a batch computation and the engine will automatically turn it into an incremental computation to give you the same result. So it will do all the job of converting at to these streaming operators for you. Yeah, I think something that's been really valuable for this ecosystem is that you've consistently provided a, a clear and concise vision for what things are going to look like in the near future, as well as what this is going to enable in the long-term future. So you have both this clear, pragmatic approach, but you also have an aspirational approach to the project, and you articulate this in your two core ideas that having these composable high-level APIs like Spark SQL or MLlib for machine learning, these things that should be very easy to use, but under the hood, they're doing things that are revolutionary. And then also this idea of building a unified engine for running complete apps. So I think the, the set of APIs, that's a little easier to understand. Okay, you want to do distributed SQL across your RDD and that's that's very easy to understand. What is what do you mean by the unified engine? This is the other part of your vision for what Spark should become. What do you mean by the unified engine? What kind of apps could people build on the unified engine of Spark? Yeah, so so by that we mean just an end-to-end -end engine or framework for distributed data analytics applications. So anything where you take in data in a either in a static data set or in a stream and process it in parallel and run different algorithms on it and you know serve basically provide results to some other system. And the reason to, to look or to try to design a unified framework for that is pretty simple. It's because all the real world applications that we see have to combine many different types of processing algorithms and libraries. And it's if you have a unified engine that understands all of them, you make it easier to build, you make it easier to manage and operate, you know, once someone has to put it in production. And you also enable optimization across all these things to happen automatically. So it's the same reason why people really like using basically unified frameworks such as uh, Django or Ruby on Rails for web development. It's just nice to have kind of a one-stop shop where all the pieces fit together and you know that they're going to work together. But in some ways, it's even more important in this data analytics space, because if you don't have unified tools, you often lose out a lot in performance or in ease of operation, because you know now you have to learn how to set up and manage two distributed systems and pass data between them efficiently. So that's that's basically the goal. Is there any analog, historical analog to that that you're inspired by, or is it more like you would like to have the first unified engine? Because I can't really think of anything yeah. that's like a Ruby on Rails for distributed computation. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, I think because distributed computation, especially for kind of this ad hoc data analytics is pretty new. I think people haven't built something like that yet. So this was probably one of the most interesting things we did. And like one of the most surprising at the time is that, you know, there were these dozens of different cluster programming models that people were proposing for different applications. Uh, even large companies like Google or Microsoft were already using these different frameworks and and we showed that you can actually get 
you know, very good support for all these workloads across what's basically a pretty simple engine. It's ba- basically MapReduce plus these RDDs for sharing data. But I think even though maybe it hadn't happened for this distributed computing, it did certainly happen for other types of computing that that people did in the past. So you, you got these end-to-end application frameworks and it's continuing to happen. You know, today you have it, for example, for client-side JavaScript stuff. You have really powerful frameworks for that, for mobile applications and so on. It's also interesting to note what happened with Kubernetes, where you saw a, a, a framework for flexible distributed systems orchestration and scheduling, and they just focused on that layer specifically. And by doing that, they gave birth to an entire ecosystem of providers that built higher level interfaces on top of that. Like you've got Rancher and Platform 9 and OpenShift and a ton of other providers providing managed Kubernetes. I could certainly see something like that happening with 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 Spark or with the, the, a collection of different big data models. Uh Yeah, yeah. And we already see a lot of Spark packages, so basically third-party packages that you can plug into Spark, including things that interact with, say, the SQL engine or the optimizer. So for example, data sources that understand how to push part of the query into the data source or machine learning operators that you can plug into a pipeline with other ones. So certainly within just the world of like open source packages you can use. There are quite a few that you can combine in this way. We've done some recent shows about streaming systems, and I want to discuss streaming with you. So a a typical architecture for streaming that I've heard from people I talk to is you have lots of events that are being created by a web application or a Fitbit or anything. And those events get put onto a stream that's maybe Kafka or Kinesis. Well, they, they get buffered to a durable system like Kafka or Kinesis that can hold the stream abstraction. And then operations are performed along those streams using a stream processing system like Spark or Flink or Kafka Streams. Is that consistent with the typical types of streaming application architectures that you're seeing? Yeah, this is definitely one common thing you see. I mean, I think the the more interesting part, at least to me, is what happens after you've got you know, the events stored reliably in a message bus, what what are you actually trying to compute on top of them? And how do you make that really easy to build? So um, so in Spark, that's one of the main things we're, we're trying to simplify with structured streaming. So for example, a lot of people take in these events, they put them in a message bus like, like Kafka or Kinesis for durability, but really what they want at the end is something they can query efficiently, some kind of historical data store, such as, you know, a, a data warehouse or a parquet file for, you know, in, in some kind of data lake for querying using Spark SQL or Hive. So one of the things that we try to do is make it really easy to get that reliable pipeline from the events coming in to whatever transformations you have to do to an efficient kind of indexed or partition format. Another example is people, for example, trying to, to update a machine learning model. So what they care about there is how do I publish the model and publish metrics and monitor it periodically. So basically, I think the just the kind of stream to stream, like let's take one Kafka stream and run a map function and produce another one, is one step you can have towards that, but it's not usually the complete application. So the, I think the, the real challenge is actually getting this end-to-end application to work that actually talks to external systems beyond that. I listen to a lot of podcasts about technical content, and the Google Cloud Platform podcast is one of my favorites. The GCP podcast covers the technologies that Google Cloud is building through interviews with the people building them. And these are often unique Google Cloud services like BigQuery, AutoML, and Firebase. I'm a big Firebase user, so I try to learn about how it works under the hood, and I want to hear about new features that they're releasing. I also listen to the GCP podcast to prepare for episodes of Software Engineering Daily because when I do shows about Google Cloud technologies, I'm doing research around them, and I find that the GCP podcast covers topics before I do. 
So if you want to stay on the leading edge of what is being released at Google and how these technologies are built, check out gcppodcast.com. I've been a listener for a few years now, and the content is consistently good. A few of my favorite recent episodes are the interview with Vint Cerf, who is one of the creators of TCPIP. He's one of the fathers of the internet. And also the show about BigQuery was super useful. You can find those episodes and more by going to gcppodcast.com and follow GCP Podcast on Twitter. Thanks to Google Cloud Platform, the podcast, for being a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. Much appreciated. Well, let's break down the the components of that end-to-end application that Spark can assist with. So the Spark approach to streaming, structured streaming, this seeks to be simpler than the current model of separate systems. It's also different than the streaming system you've had for a while, which is Spark streaming. Yeah, uh-huh. can, can, you, can you explain how structured streaming works and contrast it with Spark streaming? Yeah, definitely. So in Spark streaming, as well as in other streaming uh, APIs like Kafka Streams or Flink or things like that, the user has to explicitly use a bunch of streaming operators and set up, you know, figure out how to run their computation in a in a continuous and incremental fashion. So for example, you can choose different types of windowing operators and set them up, choose different ways of managing the state, and so on. So basically, the user is kind of compiling this high-level thing they want to do. Like, for example, maybe they dr- just want to group and count the events by device type and time or something and they have to map it down to these streaming operators. The way structured streaming is different is that it tries to do that for you automatically. So what you do is you give it a computation you want to run, you express it as a data frame, computation on uh, as if you had all the data in advance. So like imagine you had a a static data set with all the data received so far. You just say what you want to do, like aggregate stuff by device ID and, and, uh, you know, the minute that the event was generated or something like that. And then it uses something very similar to, you know, a database query optimizer to come up with a plan of uh, physical operators that do that, including the different forms of stateful management operators and things like checkpointing for fault recovery and so on. So the main difference is the user doesn't need to know about the streaming operators and the different ways of configuring them in advance. They just need to know what query they want to express, and then the system will automatically choose them. So it's basically, if you know how to write a Spark job on static data, you already know how to write a job on uh, on streaming data. So that's what I mean by higher level. And then I guess, I mean, one one aspect of it is basically like converting your computation into streaming operators. But the other aspect that's a bit more subtle, but is also important, is basically ensuring end-to-end consistency and reliability across the input streams and the output system. So figuring out like, you know, if I'm supposed to periodically upload my results into, say, my SQL, how do I know if I crash where I left off? How do I update them transactionally and so on? So that's the other thing that's built into the structured streaming IO components, like the the input sources and the sinks. So, and that's something that we often found was a big pain point for people is like, they'll set up a streaming job, you know, it runs fine. And then if something crashes, they have to manually figure out what was left over and how to recover. Or if they want to change the computation or if they discover a bug, they need to go back and like manually clean things up. So we try to simplify that as well. And the word structured, uh-huh. structured streaming in contrast to just streaming, I believe that this refers to the fact that you're assuming that the objects in the stream have a structured schema. Yeah. Is that is that right? That's exactly it. Yeah. It's the same it's the same word we used for the data frame and, and SQL APIs of Spark. We call them the structured APIs. It's a little bit confusing maybe in in some ways, but that's kind of the word we chose. And and the the main point is is that 
they, they have a schema we know, but also it's kind of a limited data model. So the type of objects you store in them, you know, there's like integers, strings, structures, arrays, there's like a limited form of objects as opposed to the RDD API in Spark where you were storing arbitrary Java objects. So because the format of them is limited and it's kind of known to the engine in, in advance, it's possible to do more optimizations and automatic management. Like you can store them in memory more efficiently. You can use like a columnar format, for example, and so on. So so that's, it, again, in contrast to like what you just said, in contrast the to the Spark, yeah. the RDD, the, the Spark streaming world where it, it just a, yeah. it's just a Java object and it doesn't have... Does that also allow for, for better data sharing between different programming languages? Oh, it, it can actually. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Yeah, so you can actually mix together user-defined functions in Java and Python and so on because there's a clear way to translate the same object into all the languages. So that, that and actually a lot of people do that. I think the the most common thing actually is if you want to write your job in Python but have some fast user defined functions in Java. This is a really nice way to connect the two. Do you use Apache Arrow for that data interchange? Yeah, so actually in the next release of Spark, which is being voted on now, so hopefully coming out very soon, it will it will be using Apache Arrow to move data from Spark into Python and back. I saw your benchmarks of structured streaming versus Kafka streams and Flink, and you just articulated one of the well, you, you gave an overview for how those might compare to those systems, but could you drill in a little bit further why, I guess, or, or we could even start higher level, how do these different streaming systems compare to one another, and how did that inform your approach to structured streaming? I know you kind of gave an overview of that. Maybe you could just drill down even further. Kafka streams and Flink are more of these, basically, as I mentioned before, they're systems where you explicitly set up some streaming operators as the user of the system and decide which ones you're going to put together and how to organize your computation. And depending on them, in Kafka streams, I believe that the data model is just Java objects. So each operator, you know, produces some Java objects, then you can serialize them somehow into a format and pass them to the next one. In Flink, I think it can also have these kind of more structured data types where it understands the internals if you if you want to use that. But one of the main differences is kind of this explicit programming. The other difference, though, and probably the, the main reason that we do better in benchmarks is just the way they do job execution. So both of these systems are based on pushing around individual objects one at a time across the different operators and even across the network. And that can be good if you want to get ultra low latency, but the overall throughput you get isn't super great because you're doing you're paying all this overhead for control logic around each record of data that you're passing through. And then Kafka streams, for example, the way you pass them through is between different operators is by writing to Kafka, where you're also paying the overhead of replication and reliable storage on disk, which becomes even higher. In structured streaming, we built on on basically the rest of the Spark engine, which can operate on batches of objects and can do code generation underneath. And you can get much higher throughput, basically because you're you're doing more CPU efficient stuff. You're also spending less time doing I.O. and coordination around each record. So in terms of throughput, we're, we're able to do, right now we're able to do several times better than all the other engines that we tested, uh, which is awesome to see because we, we didn't do any optimization specifically for streaming. This is just the same existing engine. When you use it for this, it just happens, you know, it, it just kind of gets a higher throughput. One reason I think it's like it's really important to look at this is because in streaming in particular, you want to run your application 24-7. And so if you instead of having, you know, 20 nodes running 24-7, if you had five nodes, it's a significant cost savings. And it's also a significant improvement to reliability because with four times more nodes, basically you're going to have uh, four times more frequent failures and maintenance events and stuff like that. So we think that maximizing throughput is really important, at least for the kinds of like big data applications that uh, that we target in these distributed engines. If Basically, if you can do the same thing with fewer nodes, it's usually a win. All right. Well, I'm, I'm glad we've covered some of the overview 
like topics because I want to dive into Delta, which is a different project that you're working on at Databricks. The current model of a typical organization with a lot of data involves some different systems that we've discussed already. You've got a streaming system like Apache Kafka or Kinesis that is, or I guess I should say message bus. That's maybe a little bit less ambiguous for the sake of this conversation. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Yeah. Okay. So you got a message bus, you've got a data lake, which might be HDFS or S3, and you've got a data warehousing system on top. Explain the roles of these different components. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, so basically, you know, what we noticed with all the different organizations setting up data pipelines today is they use these three different types of systems. So the message bus is a system that allows uh, low latency ingest, and it also allows uh, basically keeping track of what data has been processed and consuming it in a streaming fashion. So if you set up something like Kinesis or Kafka, you can set up different consumers that each know what offset they're in inside each partition of the data. So that's kind of its role. It's sort of coordinating across applications and also just providing low latency ingest. So that's one type of system, but it's not really meant for long-term storage of, of lots of data. It, it becomes pretty expensive compared to other systems. So then you've got the data lake. A good example of this is, is S3 or the Hadoop file system. This is something designed for high capacity, very low cost storage. So everyone pretty much uses some kind of data lake for their uh, long-term storage because it's just the least expensive option. And in this system, you know, you can put in objects, you can get them out, but it doesn't really provide any notion of subscribing to a set of objects or any kind of indexing or any kind of structure over them. So it's not always efficient to do stuff with, with these objects, but it is it is very low cost. And then finally, you've got data warehouses, and many organizations they basically they take their data from a message bus, they put it, you know, they do a few transformations or cleaning, they put it in a data lake, and then they periodically run jobs that take a subset of the data and move it into a data warehouse to enable fast interactive queries. And the main difference between a data warehouse and a data lake is that it does uh, indexing of the data. So it, it stores it in an efficient way. It builds other data structures that allow fast lookup. And it also provides higher level structure and, and reliable transactions across it. So you can have someone updating a table while someone else is querying it and so on. Whereas in the data lake, and in the message bus uh, system, it's sort of a wild west. If different people are doing stuff at the same time, you'll see these inconsistent snapshots of the data. So these are the three systems, and you see they have different characteristics. So basically, a data warehouse has the best query performance, but has a pretty high cost. Uh, the data lake has the lowest cost per byte, and the message bus has low latency, but it doesn't have high capacity for long-term storage. In this typical model of the data flowing through an organization, where did Spark fit for the last two and a half years? Yeah, so Spark itself is primarily focusing on the computation part. It doesn't really store data long term. I mean, it, it will store data short term within a computation, as we discussed. So, so Spark can be used for for several things. It can be used for the streaming jobs that take in events, maybe from a message bus, and then transform them. And either they immediately publish a result or they load the data into a data lake. It can be. It can also be used for the jobs on top of the data lake itself, if you want to compute something on it directly, or if you want to take a subset of the data and push it into a data warehouse. And using Spark SQL and using some of the more efficient storage formats, such as Apache Parquet, you can also begin using Spark as a, as a data warehouse on top of the data lake data, but because you can store the, your data in one of these more efficient formats and, and then have faster queries. But it still lacks full-on indexing, and it's still lacks a reliable way to do transactions because the data lake is basically you know, a file system or a key value store where anyone could be changing the data underneath you at any time. For some companies, it's going to make sense to have these different components separated. So if, if I'm Netflix, then I've got such a proficiency in 
technical infrastructure that, you know, it's probably okay for me to have a data lake and a queuing system and data warehouse. And I want to tweak these things and experiment with them and have, you know, duplication of different components in some places. But for many organizations, this is going to be way too complex. We don't have the engineering resources for this. So what do you see as the trade-offs between having these three different components separated versus having them consolidated with some simpler APIs, some simpler ways of interacting with them and getting data through them? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think in general, if you want very high degree of control over your data management and storage, you may want to use these many different specialized systems. But really, the, the issue has been that so far, there wasn't an obvious way to simplify these architectures and to consolidate them because each of these systems had its own trade-offs. So if you if you just like the data lake for its cost efficiency, you couldn't get kind of reliable transactions across it and you couldn't get high performance indexing and this, this ability for consumers to, you know, to be notified when new data arrives. So you had to combine it with these other systems if you wanted those performance characteristics. So I think many organizations, if they had a way to simplify this, they would, they would use that. Because one of the fundamental issues with having more of these systems is also that it, it, it beyond that, adding complexity, you know, which maybe you can manage through a lot of engineering, it also adds delays and latency in terms of moving data between one and the other. So anything you can do that removes one of these steps, you know, will let you actually get access to the latest data faster and, and show it to people that are actually running applications on it. So I think if possible, I think People would love a, a system that combines kind of the best of these, but of course, you you have to make sure that it uh, actually delivers that for the right applications, and you know that it actually gets the acceptable performance and cost and reliability that you that you expect. Which yeah. gets us to Delta, which you're working on. So this project, DataBricks Delta, so this is a combination of a data streaming system, a data lake, I'm sorry, I should say message bus, message bus, a data lake, and a data warehouse. Explain how Delta works. Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. So Delta is uh, is essentially the first uh, data management or or storage product that Databricks has built. So it's pretty exciting to to get that released. Uh, initially, Databricks has primarily been focused on computation using Apache Spark. And our model was, hey, use whatever storage system you want, use multiple storage systems, and we'll just give you a great environment to run computations across them, which is Apache Spark plus all the tooling we have around it to make it easier to use and more performant. So that was the initial model. But then we saw that basically every customer was struggling with the same issues in terms of setting up a data pipeline, which is how do I reliably move stuff between a message bus, data lake, data warehouse? Some customers had just, you know, just uh, two of those things, but it's still the same issue. So that turned out to be basically a major point of friction for everyone, you know, e even before they, they begin to use Databricks. And we even had this issue internally with our own data pipeline. Pipeline. We wrote the data pipeline several times in order to make it really kind of foolproof and reliable to get data from like the different event sources we monitor into formats that we can then actually use to make decisions in the company. So after seeing that for a while, we, we asked ourselves, we already saw people were excited to use S3 and then data formats like Parquet as a data warehouse as well. They were saying, well, look, if I can just have my data in S3 and have acceptable performance for those data warehouse queries, then I don't need to set up a separate system and populate it and make sure that's reliable. And we, we decided to, uh, you know, to, to sort of embrace this and also extend it to supporting the message bus component. And basically what Delta is, is it's a data management system that uses S3 underneath for the raw storage. So Delta itself tracks, it tracks a set of tables in S3, and it also tracks uh, input streams, including, you know, being able to let people listen to each stream and being able to load data incrementally and notify uh, these consumers and so on. And in contrast to just using S3 by itself, it adds the concept of transactions and of uh, indexing on top of it. So as data flows into a Delta table, you can have transactions 
you can make sure that consumers don't see the data until it's all in there and it's ready to use. And you can also have indexing. So over time, for example, you can compact files into a single big file. You can sort them. You can partition them. You can build different types of indexes on them. And you can start getting similar performance to what you would get in a data warehouse. And it's a it's a pretty kind of cool design overall because basically you just have kind of the the brains of a of a data warehouse and of a message bus which is just keeping track of this metadata but for the actual storage we use s3 so you get this super low cost storage uh, kind of uh, arbitrary scale whatever scale amazon s3 provides or azure block store or whichever storage system you're using but at the same time you get all the control logic of these other systems not to mention you don't have to worry about running an an HDFS cluster. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I think if you're if you're in one of the public clouds, you could already. A lot of users there don't run HDFS anyway because they just use S3 or. Oh, of uh, course. Storage. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. But, right. But yeah. But yeah. Definitely, you don't have to manage it yourself. Right. Uh, so, so we think it's it's a, it's pretty exciting. Basically, maybe the surprising thing about it is that you can get very good performance for both the streaming side and and the uh, warehousing side, the the queries. And so, once you do that, it's really attractive to just use S3 underneath. It's probably going to have higher availability than you know any other system you would stand up on your own, unless you invent you know, unless you invest a lot of work into that. And it's it's always, you know, it's kind of always up. You can scale up, you can read thousands of streams at a time from it if you want. And, and basically, you don't have to worry about the long-term storage. QCon AI is a software conference for full-stack developers looking to uncover the real-world patterns practices, and use cases for applying artificial intelligence and machine learning in engineering. Come to QCon AI in San Francisco from April 9th to 11th, 2018, and see talks from companies like Instacart, Uber, Coinbase, and Stripe. These companies have built and deployed state-of-the-art machine learning models, and they've come to QCon to share their developments. The keynote of QCon AI is Matt Ranney, a senior staff engineer at Uber ATG, which is the autonomous driving unit at Uber. And he's an amazing speaker. He was on SE Daily in the past. And if you want a preview for what he is like, then you can check out that episode that I did in conversation with him. I've been to QCon three times myself, and it's a fantastic conference. What I love about QCon is the high bar for quality. Quality in terms of speakers, content, and peer sharing, as well as the food and the general atmosphere. QCon is one of my favorite conferences, and if you haven't been to a QCon before, make QCon AI your first. Register at QCon.ai and use promo code SEDAILY for $100 off your ticket. That's QCon.ai, and you can use promo code SEDAILY for $100 off. Thanks to QCon for being a sponsor of SE Daily, and check out QCon.ai to see a fantastic cutting-edge conference. So contrast this with the model of the different components. So if I've got, for example, this system of Fitbits, let's say I've, I've got a small Fitbit-like company and all the users are simultaneously reporting data about their location. Let's say every 10 seconds they send, or, or let's just, let's make it one second. Every one second, their GPS location is being communicated to my Delta cluster or system, whatever you want to describe it as. Give me an idea for the path that a piece of data would take from the user's device into Delta to a business analyst or a machine learning application. Sure. So, so let's look at the simple case where you're uploading events from these devices, let's say every few minutes, and then you want them to get into a format that's very efficient to query. So for example, your downstream application or your analyst might ask questions like how many events of, of a specific type happened for users in California in this time range. So if you didn't 
have a system like Delta, you would probably have to set something up involving basically a couple of storage systems and some streaming jobs to move data between them. So for example, you would receive these events into a queue, and then you'd have a job that periodically reads stuff from the queue and then writes something like an Apache Parquet file or a Hive table where the data is sorted and partitioned in a way that makes it possible to do fast queries. And then you need to make sure that job is up and running and so on. If you use Delta, you can upload these events into it basically by just putting a file into S3 in a specific location. And then over time, the system, as it receives these, it will move them into a format that's partitioned and that's indexed in the right way. It will consolidate the files and so on. And when someone does a query over this table, they'll see the data that's been consolidated into an efficient form, and they'll also see maybe the latest files that haven't been compacted and merged yet, and the query will work across them. And this will happen in a transactional way, where if we're in the middle of taking a bunch of files and sorting them and and producing a new parquet file, we're not going to see the intermediate results of that. Like the, The system knows which files are ready to use and which ones are not. So basically what you'll get is you you just upload stuff into a folder in S3 and then you run your queries on the other end and you get kind of this fast performance without having to manually decide how to set up that job to, to translate them. So what's the user experience for programming against Delta? Like whether I'm a business analyst or a machine learning algorithm writer? Yeah, good question. Yeah, Delta is uh, is just exposed as a data source in Spark, which is similar to how you expose files in HDFS or Hive or Apache Cassandra or systems like that. So all you have to do is wh- when you create your data frame or your streaming job in Spark, you say the input source is Delta and you, you give the, the Delta uh, location basically in S3 where this table is being managed. And then you just run normal Spark commands after. Same thing if you're an analyst using SQL, for example, you would define a table that's backed by Delta using just a SQL command, like a create external table, and then you would run SQL queries over it. So that's the way we're exposing it. So any kind of Spark application using the the Spark APIs can, can read consistent sort of snapshots of data from Delta. So if I understand this project correctly, you are consolidating the message bus with the data lake. Is that right? Yeah. And with the data warehousing bits after with basically maintaining the data in a form that's efficient to query. Right. Okay. Yeah. Because I was thinking of data warehouse as the, the business uh, of as the business application on top of it, but that's not really what the data warehouse is. The yeah, data warehouse guess, is yeah. the thing that powers the business application. Yeah. It's the storage part. That's what I mean by it. Yeah. There are, yeah. I, I just mean the storage part of it. Yes. Right. Okay. So one question, I, I know I asked you this over email, but I, I feel like we should ask, we should go over this again because people use their message bus in more ways than just as a system of data lake ingress, basically, right? Like people use their their message, their Kafka bus as a way to shuttle logic between different user-facing applications, for example. It's a pub-sub system where you subscribe to topics and you publish topics. And so I guess my question is, does, does Delta provide that pub sub functionality as well? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. So you you can use Delta to publish and subscribe to, you know, to data coming into different tables. And we have users that are doing this already. They're setting up these pipelines that have multiple streaming jobs and one job produces data and then the other one consumes it. So the the data source for Delta, when you use it in a in a streaming job, it supports keeping track of what data it's uh, processed so far and being notified just on new data. So so it can be very good for doing this for analytics jobs. The one trade-off compared to using like a pure message bus is because Delta is backed by S3, it probably has slightly higher latency than a than say just an in-memory message bus. But on the other hand, it is, you know, it is highly reliable and is it is geo-replicated and stuff like that. So if you wanted something with like super low sort of millisecond latency across a bunch of applications, like say some microservices, 
it probably wouldn't be the right thing to use. But if you wanted something where you're running a bunch of, of analytics applications and you need to like reliably transform data into a given format and, and have it come out the other end, then you need to have many workers, many machines working in parallel to do this, then it's probably a good fit for doing that. I see. What kind of feedback have you gotten from people for how they're using Delta? Yeah, we've seen very positive feedback so far because, again, it's driven by exactly the kind of issues that people have when they just begin using S3 and, you know, different systems around it, like S3 plus Kinesis or just S3 plus uh, plus Apache Spark to do some, some computations. And so... Basically, without Delta, there's a lot of trouble with, uh, okay, how exactly do I manage the data in S3? How do I make it so that when one of my jobs is uploading a result, it doesn't mess up the files that are being used by another job to do interactive queries and so on? And you get all these weird sort of consistency errors to deal with and all this work to make it reliable, which comes up again whenever anything breaks. Like, you know, if you have a, if you have to update one of your jobs or something, you need to go back. So users really appreciate that it simplifies this. I'll give just one example of a, of a, of a Databricks customer that we talked about when we announced Delta. This is a very large Fortune 100 company that's using Delta and and Databricks and Spark for information security. So they have their security team, like many other companies, collects events from all kinds of devices on their networks, from you know operating systems, different types of intrusion detection systems and so on. And it wants to collect these events and basically build some kind of warehouse where analysts can search through the logs and can, can run programs that automatically identify certain cases that identify possible security attacks. And before using Delta, they had basically a large uh, data lake based on Hadoop where they would collect all the data so they could store all of it, but it wasn't efficient to query. And then they had a bunch of data warehouses and the data warehouses had to be much smaller because they're just uh, very expensive. And some of them also had scaling limits. So they could only have about two weeks worth of data in the warehouses where the analysts can do really quick queries. And then if you ever had a query where you need to go farther back, like, you know, you discover a new, uh, say, a compromised user account and you want to see what did they do in the past six months, you had to go to the data lake, write it in a different programming model and run this kind of slow computation. And the whole system uh, also had a bunch of complex jobs to move data through. And it actually took about six months for a team of 20 people to build the whole system, which is quite a bit of an investment. You can imagine it's difficult to change. So we tried using Delta for the same use case and basically just using the built-in features of Delta for indexing and using S3 as the data lake, uh, we were able to get comparable performance to those data warehouses for the whole range of historical data. So many multiple petabytes of data can live in S3. It can be updated reliably, you know, in in real time as new events happen. And then analysts can run the queries directly against everything and get very good performance and not have to worry about moving them into a separate warehouse and dealing with this like two-week limit. So they were really excited to see that. They were also excited because just by using Spark, they're able to run other types of computation, like different machine learning computations as well. And I think it's an awesome example of where you need, you really want the the massive scale and the low cost of something like S3, because in the security world, you want to keep as much data as possible for as long as a time as possible to identify threats. But you also need this very fast indexing and this sort of agile environment where, you know, potentially hundreds of engineers and analysts can each set up their own queries and their own jobs and work on a clean version of the data and like track different types of events. So with the model of having the three separate components, the data warehouse, the message bus, and the data lake, you've got a the API for the ingress is probably you're writing to a topic on that message bus. What's the ingress API for Delta and how do those events make their way from the ingress point to the data warehouse? 
So if you just want to use Delta by itself, you can do ingress by uploading files into S3 in a specific location. And there's a nice REST API you can get from S3 or from, it also works with the, the Azure data store. So with either of those, you can use the REST API to upload a file. And, you know, it's a it's an API endpoint that's like available across all of the cloud data centers in the world. And it's like highly available and you can just put in your data. If you'd like, you can also ingest data into Delta using a Spark application. So for example, you can you can have your, your message bus, maybe you're using the message bus for something else as well. And then you can have a structured streaming job that reads from Kinesis and writes into Delta. And that's also supported. So I'm glad we've gotten through Delta, really interesting project. I want to ask you now a little bit about some of the, I think, future-leaning kinds of topics. So there's two things I want to approach with you, and maybe we can do them simultaneously. So one is deep learning, and the other is the cloud versus edge computing. So these are two really big topics, and they are somewhat related because as we have more and more deep learning workloads, you could imagine more and more data is being shuttled between devices at the edge and devices in the cloud. And then you know, the the discussion of how data makes it from the edge to the cloud has been a repeated topic on you know, in some of the shows that I've done recently where you have all of these devices that sit in between your for example your smartphone and or your laptop and the cloud you know you've got maybe you're going to have connected cars you're going to have drones flying around outside so i guess uh, you can take these two topics separately or together how do you think deep learning and the discussion of cloud versus edge is going to affect your approach to distributed systems in the next five to 10 years? Yeah, these are great questions. Yeah. So maybe I'll start by talking about deep learning and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about cloud versus edge as well. So yeah, actually I've been you know working a bunch on deep learning topics, both at Databricks and also in my research at Stanford with, uh, you know, with my PhD students and collaborators there. Basically, it's a really exciting tool to have in in the machine learning toolkit because it finally gives us a a pretty reliable way to work with unstructured data such as uh, images and audio that is that was very difficult to featureize and work with before but i think there's a lot to be done to make it really usable and robust in a lot of applications so I guess there are a few different projects in there. So one of the things that we're looking at at Databricks is just higher level APIs for using deep learning. For example, if I just want to build an image classifier, today I have to go around and Google for implementations of different models and try all of them and make sure I've tuned them correctly for my data and so on, and then pick the best one for my data. So is there any way we can make that faster and just give you just give you a, a simple API to try all of those and give you the best one. That's one of the, the the things or the use cases that we've been working on. In terms of the more research aspects, there are still many interesting limitations of deep learning. So one limitation is from a, basically from a performance standpoint, the more sophisticated deep learning models, the ones that get very good performance in terms of accuracy, uh, are also uh, very computationally intensive. So there's the question of how can you efficiently run that model on lots of data or on an edge device that doesn't have a lot of computing power. And one of the projects I'm uh, working on at Stanford is actually a, a visual Query engine that can automatically optimize inference for these models. It's called NoScope, and it basically figures out when can it use a smaller model to get an answer. When when does it need to use a larger model because the example or the input is difficult to to classify? So that's one interesting area. The other really interesting area where I don't really have a solution, but I just think people will face this is actually security and to some extent debugging as well. So it turns out that every deep learning model model out there is amenable to these adversarial inputs where you can change a few pixels in an image or you know a few words in a piece of text and you can make it give a wildly incorrect answer it's a very it's kind of a fascinating phenomenon it just seems to be inherent to the nature of these models that because they have so many parameters and they're so nonlinear there's going to be these small inputs but i think people will have to solve this for a lot of real applications if they actually want to use deep learning there So I think there's lots of exciting stuff. I'm personally 
most interested in these issues of productionizing it and making it easy to build applications. I'm less interested in just developing better deep learning models. So there are a lot of people doing that as well. It's just, it, it seems that we have a good understanding of how to do that, but we have less understanding of, you know, how could I actually have a production application that I can make, you know, reasonable sort of assessments of that I'm going to deploy that uses this. Definitely. Okay. Well, we can save cloud versus edge for the next time, perhaps. <laughs> a bit off more than I could chew with that question. Okay. Well, Matei, thanks for coming on the show. It's been really great talking to you. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Happy to chat more anytime if you'd like. These are, you know, these are really good questions. So. Today's podcast is sponsored by Datadog, a cloud-scale monitoring platform for infrastructure and applications. In Datadog's new container orchestration report, Kubernetes holds a 41% share of Docker environments, a number that's rising fast. As more companies adopt containers and turn to Kubernetes to manage those containers, they need a comprehensive monitoring platform that's built for dynamic, modern infrastructure. Datadog integrates seamlessly with more than 200 technologies, including Kubernetes and Docker, so that you can monitor your entire container infrastructure in one place. And with Datadog's new live container view, you can see every container's health, resource consumption, and running processes in real time. See for yourself by starting a free trial and get a free Datadog t-shirt at softwareengineeringdaily.com slash datadog. That's softwareengineeringdaily.com slash datadog. Thank you, datadog. Wow.